application of market principles, as indeed they were, uh, but it still continues. So let's just take some couple of recent headlines, and I'll end with that. Uh, the uh, few few days ago, or I don't know, about a week ago, I guess, in the business section of the New York Times, uh, there was an upbeat article uh, saying that for the first time, uh, you, the United States had taken the lead uh, in speed of supercomputers. So U.S. supercomputers were now faster than Japanese supercomputers for the first time. Notice I'm not talking about tomatoes. I'm talking about a centerpiece of the you know advanced high-tech economy. Uh, yeah. Uh, so now it turned out this year, uh, Cray Research, which is a big supercomputer maker, uh, had managed to produce a supercomputer that was faster than the Japanese. So we have first place. Great. Shows the miracles of the market. Uh, what they didn't point out was a couple of other things. Uh, a couple of days before that, there had been a headline in the New York in the Wall Street Journal uh, on the new Clinton administration decision to extend a Reagan agreement to bar Japanese supercomputers from the U.S. market. The Reagan administration simply barred supercomputers from the U.S. market because they were too good and were better than U.S.-made ones. And the Reagan administration, uh, the Clinton administration, just extended that with a new bar against uh, Japanese supercomputers in the U.S. market. And they, they, the Wall Street Journal said straight out, "This is in order to protect prey research primarily, which can't compete with the Japanese." Uh, there are lots of other barriers. The the virtually sole purchaser of supercomputers has been government institutions like the Pentagon and the DOE and so on. And for them, Japanese supercomputers are totally barred. Okay, so they're not even allowed to compete for that. That's America first. You know. So for the market for supercomputers, the Japanese are barred altogether. Now they're barred. The Reagan administration furthermore barred them from import. Now the Clinton administration has extended it. Uh, now, finally, Cray has better supercomputers. Why? Because they've of the technical advances in massively parallel computing, which it turns out were supported and developed by the government, uh, by DARPA, the Defense Research Project Agency, uh, funded by the government. Government means the public. So designed, funded by the public, uh, right through the 1980s with large-scale new expenditures. Uh, so while the Reaganites were closing off the market to Japanese supercomputers, uh, the state system here, which usually works under a Pentagon cover, that's the main source of advanced technology and so on, uh, the Pentagon system has been, was created, meaning your taxes, uh, were designing and creating uh, new computer technology, uh, massively parallel computing, uh, which Cray Research was then able to use uh, to finally build the fastest computer after having uh, shut down the Japanese, have cut out the Japanese, uh, and uh, continuing, because we don't want to take any chances, to continue to block them from the market. Well, this turns out to be quite typical. It's not a, if, if you want to, uh, well, so that would, I'll give you one last example. Uh, this is true of every dynamic sector of the economy, virtually every dynamic sector of the economy. Uh, Cray is maybe extreme. Cray is called private enterprise, which is partly true. The profits are private and the management is private, but nothing else about it is private. Uh, the market is government, almost totally government. The technology is state subsidized, developed, and um, supported. Uh, but the profits are, and, and if there's any risk, that's taken by the public. So risk is socialized. Cost is socialized, ideas are socialized, development is socialized, but profit is, and they're protected from competition, but profit is privatized and management remains privatized. That's very typical of the way the economy works. I said that was going to be the last example, but I'll give you one more. Uh, the World Bank Development Report, which is quite interesting, those things are worth reading. Uh, they, uh, uh, give an, they are now in favor of what they call state market interaction. They think it's a good thing, it's a shift from before. And they give their prime example of healthy state market interaction, the way it ought to work, state private interaction, working at its best. The example is the internet. That's their example. Well, let's take a look at the internet. Uh, the internet uh, was developed for about 30 years completely by the public, 
uh, it, all of the, the software, the hardware, you know, the satellites, I mean, everything about it was completely within the public domain, the packeting systems, all the new designs. In fact, the, the only part that wasn't created by the public in the United States was created by the public in Europe. Uh, the basic ideas for the World Wide Web came out of CERN, you know, the Inter International Laboratory in Geneva, which is again a international government laboratory. That's virtually the whole story. Uh, after about 30 years of this, uh, just right now, the last two or three years, it's handed over to private power. Uh, so yeah, Bill Gates, who was typical parasite, you know, kind of watching on the outside, absolutely no interest, uh, now wants to take over the internet. Uh, and it is heading to do it, and uh, private power is not keep being secret about what they intend to do. What they want to do is take this system developed at public expense, initiative, uh, ideas, technology, and so on, and use it for two purposes. Uh, one purpose is for what's called an intranet, that is to carve out big pieces of it which are simply used for purposes of corporate transactions. So if General Electric wants to have, you know, interactions between its office and, you know, New York and Zurich or wherever they are, you know, Penang and so on, they'll have this closed system with firewalls so you can't break into it, and that'll just be for them and similarly for other big corporations, other major private tyrannies. So that'll be a large part of the public system, and the rest of it is supposed to be used as kind of like a home marketing service. Uh, to try to turn people into passive consumers, you know, you in the tube, that's the social unit on which society is constructed. Uh, so you don't have to worry about interacting, thinking people doing really bad things like those folks in the slums of Port-au-Prince a couple of years ago. Uh, but they'll, the people will be passive and obedient and hooked on consuming for themselves and not caring about anyone else. And then you really won't have to worry much about uh, the, dane, the threat of democracy, at least that's the idea. Meanwhile, massive propaganda in the ideological institutions tells you all sorts of, teaches you all sorts of mantras and so on and so forth. Now, that's pretty much the way the story works, I think, at any point where you look at it in detail. Uh, so anyhow, my suggestion is take the slogans and look at them, you know, take them apart, see what they actually mean when you look at them in practice. Where do they work? Where don't they work? How do they work? Uh, what are the results? I think you find a picture that's very, very different from the conventional one. Okay, your, your turn. <laughs> Certainly not the weapons, that we can be certain about, because they had the same weapons up till 19, almost the same weapons up till 1990, and they were getting them from us, and from England, and from Germany, and from France, and nobody was worried about them then, because Saddam Hussein was a real nice guy. He was uh, one of our major friends and trading partners. Uh, George Bush, and the Bush administration was in fact getting around congressional restrictions to continue pouring aid and credits on their good friend Saddam Hussein. In some way, it's not just the weapons that they weren't concerned about, it's also the terror. Almost all of Saddam, Saddam Hussein's a monster, but virtually all of his crimes were committed then. 
you know, before, the extra crimes during the invasion of Kuwait were very slight. As con I mean, like the gassing of the Kurds, which now everyone is supposed to be angry about. You weren't supposed to be angry about in 1988 when it was going on, because then we were supporting Saddam Hussein. So it didn't matter if he was gassing Kurds or the torture of dissidents and the rest of it and so on. That was all while he was our boy, you know. So it can't, the, with a, we can rule a few things out. The problem isn't the weapons. The problem isn't the terror and the violence. It's something else. Uh, well, you can even proceed further. Uh, is it something that changed radically when he invaded Kuwait? Well, in a sense, yes. He disobeyed orders, and you're not allowed to do that. Uh, but did the United States turn against him when he invaded Tw Kuwait? Well, you can check that out easily enough. Uh, the so-called war, well, that's a good name for it, but what's called the Gulf War ended in early March 1991. Okay, At that point, the U.S. forces stopped fighting. Uh, Saddam Hussein didn't stop. Uh, he immediately turned to huge massacres. Uh, there was an uprising in the south of Iraq, Shiite uprising, uh, with rebelling Iraqi generals, in fact, you know, trying to overthrow Saddam Hussein, popular uprising to overthrow Saddam Hussein in the south, right under the eyes of Stormont Norman Schwarzkopf, you know, U.S. Army sitting there, total control, you know, of everything. This uprising is going on. Rebelling Iraqi generals were pleading with the United States to just not to help but just to allow them to have access to captured military equipment. U.S. refused, flatly refused, I refused to offer them any help whatsoever, sat by quite happily while Saddam Hussein massacred and suppressed the uh, uh, rebellion in the south. Towns like Basra were probably more destroyed by Saddam's attack, you know, under our eyes, helping him out tacitly, than even than during the so-called war. Uh, he then moved on, the uh, same thing then happened in the north. Uh, there was a Kurdish uprising, same thing. The uh, United States stood by quietly. Uh, something different happened in the North. Uh, the North, there began to be some publicity. There was no publicity about the South. Besides, they were just a bunch of dirty Arabs anyway, so nobody really cared. Uh, the North was a little bit different. The Kurds are Aryans. Uh, so, and if you remember the uh, television reporting, not well, you remember that, but it was quite striking. I mean, television reporters would go and say, look what's happening to these blue-eyed, blonde children just like ours, you know, monstrous, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, for whatever reason, partly just racism, partly other reasons, uh, the, the, there was publicity going around about these, the massacres in the North. And the Bush administration was forced to take some steps. Didn't do much, but they declared a no-fly zone and you know, did some things to terminate the massacres in the north. If you look at what's happened since, uh, basically they're letting the Kurds go down the tube, they're supporting Turkish invasions and so on. Well, that's Saddam Hussein. Uh, is it? And in fact, uh, if you go back to spring of 1991, for not just Brzezinski, but even the mainstream press was pretty straight about it. Uh, Thomas Friedman, who was the uh, chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times at the time, and a Middle East specialist, uh, he explained why, he's a sort of State Department spokesman in the New York Times, what it amounts to. He explained why the United States was supporting Saddam Hussein as he was crushing the rebellions, and he said, well, I said, uh, we need stability. Everybody said that. The main thing we need is stability. You know, it's a good thing. Uh, so uh, what does stability mean? He says, well, the best thing, what the United States would really like, he said, is an, um, this is virtually a quote, is an iron-fisted military junta which would rule Iraq the same way Saddam Hussein did before he stepped out of line. That would be the top priority. But we can't quite get that because it's kind of embarrassing to have Saddam Hussein there. So the next best would be to have an iron-fisted military junta which would rule Iraq the way Saddam Hussein did, but with somebody else doing it. Well, we couldn't quite get, you know, that's what we're going to try to get. And the worst thing that would be possible would be a democracy. In fact, right through this period, the U.S. was refusing, and to my knowledge still is refusing, to have any contact with Iraqi Democrats. You take a look through the whole uh, period of the, you know, the build-up to the Kuwait War, and, you know, the Gulf War, and huge publicity and everything. Ask yourself how often Iraqi Democrats appeared in the United States press. 
I'll give you the answers. You don't have to bother looking. Zero. Uh, there are plenty of them. Uh, the first break in the, and the, it's not that they were kind of dangerous radicals or anything. They're mostly conservatives. So the head of the Iraqi democratic movement is a London banker, you know, Ahmed Chalabi. Uh, he finally was allowed an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. I think it was around April 1991, you know, after the war was over. I think that was the first break. And the State Department was saying straight out when asked, we will not have contact with the Iraqi Democrats because that would be interfering in the internal affairs of Iraq. And, you know, we don't do things like that. I mean, the same. And so whatever is going on, it's none of these things. So, so what is going on? Look, uh, Saddam Hussein broke rules. One of the rules of world order is you do what you're told. Okay? You want to murder gas Kurds, you know, murder dissidents, crush Shiites, and so on. That's fine because we're in favor of that. But we didn't want you to, and in fact, the United States even pretty much told them, we don't mind if you rectify the borders with Kuwait. You know, like some disputed borders, okay, you know, move a little bit, shake your fist, and raise the oil prices. We don't care about that. But uh, taking over uh, a core element of the U.S. British uh, wealth system, that's not allowed. Uh, Kuwait was, this is all discussed in much detail in declassified documents, which any sane reporter or scholar would have instantly looked at when the Gulf War began from 1958, when Iraq broke out of the Western-dominated system. There was a huge, inter you know, the tremendous turmoil in Britain and the United States. The documents are declassified. And uh, there was a lot of discussion. So the British Foreign Secretary flew to Washington and had big debates with discussions with Dulles. They decided what to do. And what they decided to do was played out almost exactly during the Gulf War. They decided that uh, the British should, Kuwait was then a British colony. They said they should give Kuwait nominal independence because that would cut back the th threat of nationalism, of independent nationalism. Uh, they were afraid that Iraqi nationalism was Nasserite, you know, it was part of the gen. They didn't worry about the communists. There was kind of a growth of radical Arab nationalism in the region. It couldn't be allowed to spread. Uh, they then decided that if anything, uh, Kuwait is a major source for uh, British wealth. You know, the, the Kuwaiti investment councils in London, the whole way the Middle East oil system works is that the profits from oil have to go to the West. They're not allowed to go to the people of the region. And the role of the ruling elites is essentially to ensure that those profits go to the West. Uh, British Britain, which is the junior partner, gets Kuwait and a few other small places. The United States, the big guy, gets the big one, like Saudi Arabia. The profits come here. Uh, but uh, they concluded that uh, Kuwait should be given nominal independence. And if anything happens, even internal to Kuwait, uh, which affects British domination, U.S. British domination, uh, Britain and with U.S. backing should ruthlessly intervene to suppress it. And the United States would do the same in the rest of the Arabian Peninsula. So if anything disturbs this arrangement, we will ruthlessly intervene to break it up uh, and restore order in our terms. And it doesn't matter whether it's internal, external, anything. It's like no Russians. You know, they made it very explicit. There's no Russian involvement. Well, okay, that happened in 1990. Uh, so uh, Iraq extended, went too far. They didn't just rectify the borders, but they took over Kuwait, uh, and the U.S. and Britain ruthlessly intervened to restore the, situ the status quo ante. Uh, now Saddam Hussein has to be punished, because you don't get away with that. Uh, of course, the punishment doesn't affect him. It's, you know, what was called genocide, and in fact, Nobody knows the details, but the Western estimates are that maybe uh, half a million or more children have been killed and probably a million or more people by the sanctions, which is only, have only strengthened Saddam Hussein because they've undermined any possibility of popular reaction to him. And if there's any democratic movement that's going to try to overthrow him, that'll probably continue to be opposed by the United States. Uh, there are other things going on, too. Um, oil prices are fairly low at the moment. In fact, gas prices at the U.S. pumps are now lower in real terms than they have ever been since 1950, believe it or not. 
the price of a gallon of oil is less now than it was in 1950. You know, not numbers, but real numbers. Uh, and uh, the U.S. It's, it's often said that the U.S. wants to keep the oil price from rising, but that's only half true. It also wants to keep it from falling. Oil prices have to stay within a certain range. You don't want to go too high because that's harmful to the Western industrial societies, but you don't want it to go too low because that cuts into the interests, to the uh, profits from for the energy companies, which are mostly U.S. and secondarily Britain. Uh, and that's a big flow of capital to the United States. Furthermore, the profits from oil, like you know, Saudi Arabian princes and so on, make a lot of profits. Uh, that usually ends up in the U.S. Treasury. I mean, it's either in Treasury securities or in purchases of weapons or in you know huge construction programs for Bechtel or something like that, uh, or in just in U.S. and British banks. So the oil price has to be kept within a certain range. Uh, and policy has largely been designed to sort of keep it there. Uh, if Iraqi oil started flowing into the market, the price would go way down. You know? uh, now, I, nobody, you can't, I'm speculating because, of course, these are unaccountable systems. You know, you can't, they don't tell you what they're doing, and they never release documentation. It's not like a government, which maybe 30 or 40 years from now will tell you something about what it was doing. This is pure secrecy. These are tyrannies. But it looks like that's what's happening. That's my guess. So how would that be punished for us? I mean, you need to ensure the stability that you want to Because hear. they're still hoping for the first best option, an iron-fisted junta without Saddam Hussein. And, you know, maybe that'll come along. Maybe some other thug like him will overthrow him, you know. To the extent that it happens, you know. Oh, sure. I mean, if, if there's a state airline, who's running it? Well, the people of the country are running it. Okay, but that's democracy. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, in fact, you know, whether the people of the country are running it or not depends on what kind of a state it is. To the extent that the state is democratic, you know, which is, it's not a yes-no thing. It has a lot of dimensions and varies. But to the extent that the state is democratic, public institutions are influenced by or their policies are determined by the public. It's kind of like a triviality. Sure, but that's like saying that, that's like saying we should, we should try to get Hitler back. Uh, because in a totalitarian state run by Hitler, there were plenty of benefits. In fact, Hitler carried out a social revolution. Germans were much better off than they were before. He was the most popular leader in German history right through the 1930s. If he'd been killed in 1939, he would have gone down in history as you know one of the great leaders of Germany. Yeah, uh, Stalin also was a brutal dictator, but he industrialized Russia. You know, Russians were a lot better off than they had been before the ones who survived, you know, uh, and most of them did, and in fact he was pretty popular, you know. Uh, yeah, it's certainly true that there are times when totalitarian dictate, brutal totalitarian dictators do bring about improvements, and that could be true of private tyrannies too. On the other hand, you should also ask yourself whether it's true. I mean, is there evidence, real evidence, that, pri that transferring management from public control to private control increases efficiency. That's a little tricky, because when you begin to look, you find a lot of other things. For example, in what you find is that in places where the society sort of functions kind of more or less honestly and well, you know, say Sweden or Chile for that matter, uh, public institutions are pretty efficient. So there is no pressure in Chile to privatize the biggest exporter because it's very efficient. Uh, where there's pressure to privatize, it's usually coming from private power, okay, and not on grounds of efficiency. And in fact, if you look at the effects, it's just very unclear what they are. So I'm going mean, to take, say, the Brazilian steel industry. I mean, it, always, it was nationalized, always ran at a loss, okay, so it looks inefficient by some measure. 
On the other hand, part of the reason it was running at a loss was because it was purposely, by state policy, producing steel cheaply for the benefit of private manufacturers. In, in, uh, so it was a public subsidy to private manufacturers, which made the steel industry look inefficient. right? But for the economy, it might not at all have been inefficient. Uh, and when you proceed, that's what you find. So like in England, which is you know, a modern country, they privatized wa the water system recently. And by economists' measures, it's probably more efficient. On the other hand, people aren't getting water. Poor people don't get water. You know? Yeah. In fact, that's efficient. Like if you if you had only one, if you were put in charge of the of the dist water distribution system and you're only go you're an automaton, all human feelings are gone. Your only interest is maximizing profit. Well, you know perfectly well what you'd do. Uh, you'd cut out water altogether uh, for people who you know can't pay for it or are sort of not densely not in some <laughs> dense area which has a lot of money. Why should they have water at all? I mean, after all, they can go walk somewhere with a bucket on their back and get water. That's probably uh, better by the macroeconomic statistics. So it's more efficient. Uh, and in fact, case after case, when you look at privatization, you find an extremely mixed picture. What you usually find is transfer of costs to the public. Uh, so take, say, privatization of roads. Well, you know, privatization of roads would mean you'd pay tolls if you're rich enough, and you'd go on nice highways. And if you're not rich enough to pay the tolls, well, you know, find your way down a dirt rut somewhere. You know, the total, um, you know, the economy might look much better. Gross national product would go up. Macroeconomic statistics would look good. For most of the people would be terrible. It's forced on them, forced on them from the outside, and it might be a good thing or it might be a bad thing. But you have to look at the cases. So, for example, just recently, uh, Brazil privatized the Vale, you know, big, huge industrial mining conglomerate. Uh, they sold it off to private power. Well, you know, that's the, a large part of the future of Brazil is there. Brazil has plenty of resources. Uh, the, there was an analysis of Vale done by, there were two analyses of the, le, you know, the uh, value of it. One was done by Merrill Lynch. That's the one the government was using. Merrill Lynch also happens to be, you know, the agent for a lot of the private purposes and purchases and so on. Another was done by the uh, uh, engineering department at the um, Federal Rio, uh, University in Rio. Good, serious people. I know some of them. I was down there about a year ago talking. Very serious industrial engineers and those people. They gave an evaluation of Valley which was far higher, uh, taking into account future needs. You know, what would iron and gold and so on be worth uh, 20 years from now to the people of Brazil and so on. Those considerations weren't taken into account by Merrill Lynch, of course, uh, but they're real. Uh, well, you know, it was sold off, and uh, now private power will make the uh, profit. Uh, I can just tell you this much. Uh, if you look at the, take a look at today's rich countries and today's poor countries, first world and third world. Go back a couple hundred years you find they weren't very different. In fact, India was the commercial and manufacturing center of the world in the 18th century. Uh, as late as the late 19th century, the British were deeply concerned by the fact that British textiles couldn't compete with Chinese textiles because they were much better and better done and so on. Uh, uh, the, they s changed. You know, uh, Egypt started to undergo an industrial revolution about the same time the United States did, with comparable prospects. You know, they had their own cotton, big agricultural area, and so on. Well, you take a look at what happened since the 18th century. Two regions have developed outside of Europe, uh, the United States and Japan. They are exactly the two regions which were able to fend off European control. Okay, uh, The U.S separated itself. Japan was able to fend off European control. Japan's had the highest growth rate in the world since the Meiji Restoration around 1860. The United States grew very fast. How did they do it? Same way Europe did, by radically interfering with market principles. So from the very beginning, the United States was super protectionist, had massive, you know, large-scale state subsidies and so on and so forth. Britain had done exactly the same. That's how it became the richest country in the world. Every other industrial developing country has done more or less the same thing. I mean, they use somewhat different measure, methods, like Japan happened to be much more liberal in trading than the United States was. 
but on the other hand, it had you know some more authoritarian internal systems, so they vary in one way or another. But invariably, I think there is no exception to this. Uh, they did it by sharp interference with market principles. Now, what about the third world? Yeah, they had ne what's called neoliberalism is not liberalism, and it's not new. Uh, they've had it rammed down their throats for hundreds of years, and that turned them.